shipping, maybe shipping lines are making the transition from coal to oil during this period. And of course, the new automobile industry is operating on the basis of oil, dominated by gasoline, um, refining the virgin oil. So clearly, the fuel impact is a major one. As a byproduct, and it's not recognized very clearly early, there, of course, are some negative sides of what's happening. People don't recognize it initially, but of course, there is some potential for pollution, air pollution, uh, water pollution. So we need to keep in mind that while there are lots of positive results, there are also lots of some potential problems. This new oil industry is going to have an influence on the state. It, it's bringing, it's a major, becoming a major part of the economy, and so the state can tax this new industry, and it will have more funds for carrying on a variety of government activities. It's interesting to note that the tax in Texas on the oil industry is lower than comparable taxes in Louisiana and Oklahoma, a couple of other oil states. Perhaps that's because the oil industry is so big in Texas, it doesn't need to be higher. On the other hand, one of the other possible impacts is that the new wealth is being funneled into politics sometimes in terms of campaign funds. And so that may influence keeping the tax a little lower than that. <coughs> we also need to understand that there's two kinds of workers, and it's a rough generalization, but in the oil industry, <coughs> There were people who worked in the oil fields, bringing in the new rails, looking at the transportation of oil, keeping those fields operating. But the oil field workers, especially the ones who really do well, are moving around from one new field to another frequently. On the other hand, oil refineries are developing, places where the oil is processed and produced turned into a variety of product. The workers there tend to stay in the same place. Refineries don't move around very much, as you can imagine. One of the results is that, and we'll talk about what's happening in terms of workers and labor, but unions are appearing, and the workers in the refineries are much more likely because they stay in one place and work together in a large group <coughs> to organize unions compared to the oil field workers who move around and may change their groupings as they move from one field to another. In addition to this rapid blossoming of the oil industry, there are other things happening economically. Shipping along the Texas coast is improved because several ports are dredging out their channels so that larger ships can come in. Now, this is happening in Galveston and Belmont. Probably the major breakthrough is deepening a ship channel all the way up from Galveston Bay to Houston on Buffalo Bayou, uh, which connects Houston to ocean going shipping. So clearly, this is a major development in terms of transportation. World War I, which takes place during this period, is also significant in economics. Texas already had some military bases, those bases are expanding. A number of new bases in the military camps are developed during the World War I period. That stimulates the construction industry. It brings lots of soldiers into Texas for their training. They're going to spend money in terms of the consumption. The services that are being provided from those towns around the base. <coughs> so clearly this is a stimulant to the economy. In addition, we find that shipbuilding, which had not been very common in Texas previously in the 19th century, is also stimulated along the Texas coast. There are no more shipbuilding companies uh, operated during the First World War, and that will have some continued impact. Transportation in general is growing during this period. Part of the reason, of course, is the oil industry, but certainly railroads are still expanding. The automobile is becoming more and more common, and that in turn stimulates another area of construction, highway construction. Paved streets exist in some of the larger cities in Texas, 
But there are many paved roads between the cities or out into the countryside. The development of the automobile has this impact of pressing the state and local governments to pay highways to speed transportation, to, to, to speed the flow of goods, but also people in place to place, which is the automobile. And finally, we need to recognize that there is some growth in manufacturing. Industries in Texas are probably more extractive than they are manufacturing. The oil industry, the lumber industry, uh, some mining activities are extractive industries. But there are also some manufacturing industries, so cotton mills, for example, and some, or some variety of other possibilities, although they're small. But they are expanding during this period, and the value of manufactured products in Texas between 1900 and 1930 will increase 10 times. So clearly we have another kind of, of industrial development there. Well, clearly all of this represents change in that rural agricultural Texas of the 19th century. Another major change is urbanization. The largest cities in Texas at the turn of the century are about 50,000 people. That seems kind of shocking to us today. By 1930, Texas will have some cities that are 250,000 people in 30 year span, that kind of growth. In 1900, 17% of Texans lived in urban areas, less than 20%. By 1930, 30 years later, 40% of Texans live in towns or cities. That's a considerable change. What we have are some major cities growing as well as the blue towns of the oil industry and some variety of smaller towns. San Antonio is growing, it had military bases earlier and connections to the South Texas cattle industry. It's also developing more tourist interest. Houston is expanding, it always had railroads in the late 19th century, but now it has a ship channel, now it has the oil industry, the refineries, concentrated in areas around Houston, and so Houston is moving. Dallas was an important business center in North Texas, but in the period just before the First World War, it requires a Federal Reserve branch bank, which stimulates Dallas as the leading banking center in Texas. And so all of these towns are going into city, major cities. Fort Worth is growing because of its connections to the West Texas cattle industry. It's a major shipping point where cattle are shipped to other parts of the country through railroads. And El Paso plays an interesting role and is also growing. It always had a military base, and certainly it had some mining activity around it. And during this period, from 1910 to 1920, it's across the border from Mexico, which is undergoing a political revolution, and virtually every side of the Mexican Revolution is seeking supplies of one sort or another in the United States, and a fair amount of that supply is going through El Paso in New Mexico. And so El Paso is being stimulated to grow rapidly. When we look at these new cities, we also see them enjoying some new technology. <coughs> this is the period when the first telephone systems are being introduced into Texas cities. It's the period when electricity is being applied to lighting on a more wide scale in Texas cities. It's also a period in which streetcars and automobiles are expanding these cities. If you think about Texas cities, they tend to grow out of are most of the 20th century cities grow outward because automobiles and streetcars make that possible. Especially if you think about them in comparison to cities, older cities in the Northeast that grow up with a lot of apartment buildings, <coughs> multi-story apartment buildings. Texas cities are very different. You see the pattern developing in this period. These Texas cities also are involved with cultural development. They're new music societies. When you bring lots of people together, you can organize a lot of music societies, social organizations. 
women's clubs that will come back and talk about that later, and team sports. Why are you developed team sports in small towns in your area? The Texas League, the Professional Baseball League, is founded in the late 19th century, but it's focused in these large cities that are growing in Texas. The Southwest Conference organizing college football and sports is organized during this period. And of course, the colleges, for the most part, with one or two exceptions, are located in the growing cities across the state. And so we see the impact of this organization. <coughs> one of the most complex areas that we need to think about in this period is politics. What we see is something different in some ways, and in some ways there will be some holdover issues from the 19th century. If you think back to the 1890s, politics was dominated by farm issues, <coughs> problems of farms. In this, this period, the progressive period as it's sometimes called, we see an urban middle class playing a major role, a much increased role in politics. politics. And clearly that's a new problem. The term progressive is an interesting one. We need to keep in mind that what seemed progressive to the people of that period, in some cases, may still seem like <coughs> to us, in other cases, may be a little more about whether it was progressive. So you can put progressive in quotation marks if you want to. One historian writing about this period titled his book, Good, Mike, and Little Brown Judge. And all of those are, they tell us something about the period. The term good was included in the title because <coughs> there is a revival of the Ku Klux Klan during this period. The Klan thinks of itself as kind of a moral organization, enforcing a certain sort of morality, but it engages in enough violence that obviously it has other images, as you might imagine. And there is other kind of kinds of violence. The term "bunt," well, the author <coughs> is intended to focus on Ma Ferguson, the first woman to serve as governor of Texas in the 1920. But we can expand that to recognize that there are a variety of women's issues, including the goal for many women in Texas of gaining the right to vote. So this is also an important part of the political picture that we're looking at. The Little Brown Jug focuses on what was the most emotional, related issue of the time period, prohibition. So with that in mind, we'll take a look at some of it. First of all, we need to recognize that the legislature is going to pass some new laws that adjust to the new business and labor situation. This is the period, for example, when the legislature says unions won't be threatened by antitrust laws. <clears throat> that it's, it's inappropriate to try to use antitrust laws against unions. Black groups are also ruled out by the legislature. The idea that someone wanted to organize a union that would be blacklisted and not hired by anybody in the industry. The idea of limiting hours, at least in some industries, begins to be considered. In the railroad industry, for example, there's an effort to limit the hours of workers for public safety purposes. You probably have fewer railroad accidents or train wrecks if workers are aware of people working on a reasonable number of hours. Child labor is limited for the first time in Texas new laws that limit child work. And workmen's compensation is created for the first time to try to deal with the problem of accidents in a variety of industries. <coughs> there is also a law passed in the 20s called the Open Court Law, which said that the new unions couldn't strive, however, if they were going to impede the flow of commerce. It's almost impossible to strike and not impede the flow of commerce, so the law eventually is going to be declared unconstitutional. But it does tell us that probably business interests had as much or more influence in the legislature as the labor unions. 
In terms of business activities, we have new state banks. This is the first period when the state authorizes charters banks. There's been many in the 19th century. There is also a commission to observe and perhaps at times regulate banking and insurance. And the legislature puts passes a law to require insurance companies to invest part of their profits from Texas in Texas. Most of the insurance companies put out of state companies during this time period. We also find the state attorney general bringing a number of antitrust cases against monopolies, businesses, companies that monopolize or totally dominate the <coughs> industry. There was real concern about lack of competition in some ways. We also have a new development in terms of city government, Galveston Commission Plan, which follows the great storm in Galveston that disrupts the city so badly. The goal of the commission plan was a more efficient government, but at the same time, it generally brought with it citywide elections, which meant that if everybody was elected citywide, there might be some parts of the city that really didn't have any representation. So it's a kind of mixed result, some positive, but also some positive result. Texas also has a greater role in national politics, especially during the Wilson administration. Several cabinet members from Texas. Obviously, it's good to have some influence in national politics. At the same time, some of those uh, cabinet members, Al Burleson, the uh, postmaster general in particular, segregated several positions to a greater extent. So, for some people, um, it had a negative impact. Complicated. Farm issues still exist, and there is debate because more and more Texas farmers are tenant farmers. They no longer own land, they have to give land. There are debates about how much they're being charged for the rent. And so the legislature will attempt to put some limits on that, viewing it as a form of usury as it goes to the tax. The state Supreme Court will eventually declare that law in the Constitution, which is an interesting decision because Texas had other usury laws. And so they're really saying it shouldn't apply in this particular area. There also is debate about voter restriction. The Democratic Party is going to introduce a white primary, which eliminates African Americans from even participating in the Democratic primary. The state legislature is going to adopt a poll tax, which affected all sorts of working class people who had limited incomes. And the overall effect is to reduce the effects of the electorate tremendously. Uh, the number of voters going to the polls after these laws pass is just a little more than half where they had been before. Clearly, that doesn't look like progressivism as we look back at it, and yet it's viewed <coughs> as progressivism by the people at the time. Well, clearly, there is some opposition to that sort of change, and we find the first NAACP chapter has been organized during this period. The first uh, LULAC, the counterpart, African American Civil Rights Organization, was organized in the 1920s in Texas. And of course, we have prohibition. Prohibition is a lively debate that goes on in Texas. <clears throat> it's supported primarily by members of evangelical Protestant churches who view it as a moral issue and are concerned about drunkenness, affecting uh, families. <clears throat> it's opposed, on the other hand, by the people who own breweries who see their business being attacked. And we also see opposition from people with, from different cultural backgrounds who came from cultures where drinking beer or wine with meal was fairly common practice. And other people simply argue it's an invasion of their individual rights. Prohibition's turned down in the state election in 1911, but it's brought back under national prohibition in Texas actually ratifies the prohibition law, uh, national, national prohibition at the end of the First World War period. 
We also need to recognize that there are women's issues. We have women's clubs organized to try to deal with a variety of issues like child labor, but also they're seeking the right to vote and they're successful. <coughs> Again, at the end of the First World War, Texas votes in favor of the national constitution amendment to allow women's suffrage, which is interesting because most southern states did vote in favor of that particular amendment. We also need to think quickly about a couple of other areas, education and the environment. <coughs> what we see in education are some significant changes. For the first time during this period, there's going to be a law requiring children to go to school compulsory education. It's not as broad in terms of ages as it will be later, but it's the first time <coughs> it's required in between certain ages to attend school. For the first time, the state is going to provide textbooks to the public schools. Rural schools are going to begin to be consolidated so that they'll be able to go beyond simply an elementary level in the winter and school houses. And teacher training is going to be expanded. Normal schools, which will become teachers' colleges, which will become state universities eventually, are being created during this period. A school like Texas State in San Marcos begins with a normal school and a whole range of similar schools across the country. <coughs> More flexible funding for the schools so that both local and state government can provide more funds. More colleges being developed, both public and private, during this period, uh, ranging from Texas Tech or UTEP to SMU and Rock. And finally, we need to grapple with the environment. This is a period when, for the first time, people begin to think, what do we need to conserve our natural resources to some extent? Uh, what we see are hunters finding fewer birds and animals out there to hunt. We're finding people who are worried that the lumber companies are cutting down in huge swaths of trees in East Texas. And there's a growing demand for water by cities, by industry, by some of the new farming er areas in West Texas. And so we have the beginnings of some conservation thought. The state creates at least a couple of new agencies in terms of the Game and Fish Commission, a forestry department. Water districts are created so that local water users can get together and think about how to, how to conserve water in their particular area. We have the first private conservation organization, the Texas Forestry Association. And the state in the 1920s will begin for the first time to set aside some land for state parks, for recreation purposes, for the public. All of these influence to some extent by these economic and urban developments that we're beginning to talk about. And so we can see the period as a period of change and significant redevelopment, modernization, and that's suggested earlier. I'm going to stop at that point and we'll sort of talk about what are the questions you want to bring up. Well, I'll take a deep breath. <laughs> I have a question concerning prohibition. In terms of enforcement, was there a difference in how we were to enforce in urban versus rural areas? I mean, most of the run running stories you can hear about are the northeast or, or around uh, the painting border. I'm sort of curious what happened along the <coughs> <clears throat> All of us who are speaking are part of being people. And uh, the, the signs for how much time I had left uh, were beginning to say I had less and less. So I didn't really follow up on that particular point, so I'm glad you asked the question. Obviously, there are different attitudes in different parts of the state, and different attitudes on the part of the people who are rural anyway. What happens when prohibition finally takes place is that you do in fact have a lot of people that comes from other states, it comes from Mexico, and there's lots of people involved in Texas. I know 
um, one of the things you should understand is that there was uh, local uh, ordinance prohibition. Cities or counties could declare themselves dry, and some had, even before state law prohibition. But even then, there was already bootleg into those areas because not everybody in the city or county was so through prohibition. And so we have the bootlegging process. And then the other thing that you see during this period is that there are a lot of pharmacies selling medicine that has a high alcohol content. <laughs> and uh, it's theoretically legal under this law. You know, that had been one of the exceptions that was allowed. But uh, it went a lot farther in that direction than people had expected. <coughs> so enforcement is difficult. And it costs money to try to enforce the law. It depends on the area as to how well it's enforced and how much can be used in the liquor service for the law. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the Ferguson's. If, yeah. they, if their perception of them was so corrupt and you know, James was impeaching on them, how come they were able to stay so popular? What was the, what, what was the, uh, the general feeling of the populace to these two? Well, <clears throat> even though this change has taken place, urbanization, industrialization, there's still, <clears throat> there's still lots of farmers. And Ferguson appeals to them, he actually promotes the law to try to set some limits on how much rent could be charged to farmers. Uh, during this period, the number of farmers who are tenant farmers goes over 50%, gets up close to 60%. And so someone who's showing some concern for those things is going to develop for in rural areas. And Ferguson's an interesting person. Um, he actually opposes prohibition, which is going to be other kinds of support in several areas. And uh, interestingly enough, opposes the plan, which is going to be some additional support. So he proposes some positive things, although he clearly has manipulated in some way. It's himself not what it's obviously. But what happens of course is that he his wife he has his wife room for governor and her campaign slogan is two governors for the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> and they do well. She's elected twice. Yes. I was wondering if you could describe a little bit more about the boom towns. Maybe it might be something interesting for seventh graders. I don't know what was life like there. Did some of these towns last, or some of these towns that we know now, or did most of them just kind of go oh. town out? Or? Well, certainly the long term history of these boom towns is usually attached to oil fields that they were part of. As long as the oil field is still operating, the towns will uh, survive, or they taper off and, and plateau. Uh, the, the, the boom period is usually relatively short at the beginning, but they may sort of continue at a certain size. Uh, they're pretty lively places when they're predominantly male. You know, there, there are a fair number of saloons, and it doesn't mean bootleggers to get liquor into the period. But they, they sell in to a more normal pattern over a fairly short period of time. But they're pretty violent places. And the Texas Rangers were brought in in some cases to help them calm down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You mentioned Texas' greater role in national elections. Uh, would oil our leverage for that? Well, I think the greater influence of Texas in national uh, politics is primarily during the administration of Woodrow Wilson because he's a Democrat. And Texas is predominantly Democratic at that time. And the result is, uh, the key probably is that Ian House, uh, I think he's the businessman, uh, has become involved in, as an advisor to gubernatorial candidates in Texas first, and then becomes an advisor to Wilson. And the result is that you have three kind of cabinet members. Uh, Thomas Gregory is Attorney General, and Robert Burleson is Postmaster General. And uh, I'm not trying to think of, uh, the 
Secretary of Agriculture is on the search from Texas. So, so it's geared to political parties to some extent. Although certainly the law industry attracts attention to the U.S. Texas Senator Cloud. This urbanization process is stimulating the overall growth of Texas and Texas has more uh, members in Congress as well. I never got confident that I covered the thing, so feel free to. Let me mention a couple of other things, and that makes it really interesting. One of the things that I didn't get through really, as I was running out of time, were some of the other changes taking place for women during this period. By 1920, almost 20% of women in Texas were working for the South for some kind of wage. Now, women had worked in the 1920s, but it was on farms as part of a family operating farm. They worked with their husband and children uh, on farms. But this is <coughs> they, They're earning a wage now, and we find different kinds of jobs. There's some traditional jobs, teaching has become uh, women's uh, role, nursing is dominated by women, and certainly there's certain, there are some of the interests <coughs> of the textile you know, male is cotton, you know, are primarily female workers. On the other hand, these new cities are creating new jobs. Telephone operators in the cities that have these new telephone systems, uh, salespeople in the new electric store, stores in the urban areas, uh, secretaries and other clerical workers in the new businesses that are developing in the city. So you get a sense of a much wider range of activity. Two interesting factors that are sort of related but are broader, more related to families. One is that the force increases during this period. <coughs> Some people worried about that as a kind of moral issue. But in fact, the reality was more influenced by the fact that women who were working were more independent. And those who found themselves in difficult marriages where they were abused or, or the family wasn't supported well were more likely to get out of that difficult situation if they could support themselves. So the greater independence of working women to deal with those situations probably has more to do with people than this kind of The other thing is that family size declines in this period. Uh, and the key factor probably is urbanization again because on farms, lots of children meant more people to help work on the farm. And so big families are more common to the rural society, farm families. When families move into cities, that's no longer true. Children don't work with parents as they go out to these jobs. And the result is a decline in the number of children that can really find an average for a couple of traditional Anything else that you should offer? Yeah. What was the role of the African American government of urbanization? Well, the NAACP, as I mentioned, uh, is organizing some chapters in Texas. Certainly, there are other organizations. There are women's organizations, uh, fraternal organizations for both men and women who are playing an important role. Uh, those organizations frequently provided uh, insurance and, and other kinds of financial support to their members. And uh, out of some of those organizations, there appear to be some <coughs> banks that were owned by African Americans. So, William McDonald, who was a fraternal leader and also a political leader in Fort Worth, uh, also helps develop a bank that even, makes it, even survives the depression in the 1930s. So, there's some interesting things happening as far as African Americans are concerned. And certainly, so Texas has several black colleges since the white colleges were segregated. And, uh, so there is a, a slowly 
growing African American middle class in these cities along with uh, the middle class in general. Yeah. Uh, what's the first year teaching Texas history? I've been doing rural cultures for years. And I feel like they didn't understand urbanization and the oil industry, but one thing that I think that they struggle with is understanding what it meant to be democratic. Because you mentioned a democratic primary. And it's, yeah. hard, it's hard to understand in their terms what it meant to be democratic at this time. Well, yeah. the reason the Democratic Party is dominant is because it was probably a more conservative party in some ways during that period. Although it wins itself, it has a progressive wing that does pass uh, some of the positive legislation of the period. <coughs> so it has internal debates uh, between those who favor some change and others who are perhaps defending older the old traditional way of operating society. Um, it all traces itself back to the Civil War. The Democratic Party is really the party coming out of the Civil War that represents the former Confederates, and the Republican Party represents uh, the small group of unionists and the new African American voters. And so you know, the, the divisions are along those lines. And that really won't change, uh, I'm sure, for the reason to tell you all about it when he talks about the New York group. Uh, it doesn't really change significantly until the 1930s when African Americans begin to change their parties and the Democratic Party shifts to a more moderate progressive position. Anything? Yeah. Uh, what was the immigration like coming from Mexico at the start? Well, the, the Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1920 produces a good bit of immigration. Uh, people wanting to get out of the line of fire, so to speak. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, there are some conflicts in Texas, uh, and I think you'll hear more about that as well later from one of the other speakers, so I don't want to invade her territory too much. But uh, there is some conflict. Uh, the ideas of the Mexican Revolution overlap in the South Texas, and there is some conflict in that area, uh, as well as the immigration. And so what you have are immigrants coming from Mexico to Texas at one point, and then when there's conflict in South Texas, you have immigrants temporarily going the other way across the border to get away from, from conflict on this side of the border. So it's a complicated But probably there is some continuing flow of Thank you. 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 Thank you.